screen. Give me a moment. Okay, we're good to go. All right. Welcome everyone. Um, it's so good to be back with all of our members from near and far. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for our second installment of our Dig Deeper Speaker Series. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome John Ballinger, who is a uh, a professor of creative writing at Mount Vernon Nazarene University. Uh, John grew up in Jackson County, Ohio, and he lives in Mount Vernon with his wife and two children. He earned an MFA in creative writing from Ashland University, and his writing has been published or is forthcoming in journals such as Appalachian Review, the New Ohio, Ohio Review, the New Crescent and Local Culture. Um, tonight, he is going to be sharing with us a little bit about Ohio and poetry, and he's calling his talk Imagery, Sound, and Form in Southern Ohio. Wallace Stegner said, no place is a place until it has had that human attention that at its highest reach we call poetry. Poetry is the compression of language, the strain, the struggle, and sometimes joy of trying to say what is difficult to say. And Southern Ohio is a place of compression, an ancient ocean and glaciers layered and pressed and crumpled this place into hills and valleys deep with shale and limestone and veins of coal. It is also a place of human life and language that deserves the kind of attention that reaches as high as possible. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to say a special thank you again to our members. You are making this evening's program possible, as well as to our speaker series sponsor, Envisage Wells. Uh, thank you again for your generous support of local history in Southeast Ohio. And without further ado, I will hand it over to John Ballinger, and I hope that you enjoy this evening's program. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, let me share my screen with you all. Hopefully that is working the way that it's supposed to be working. So it's great um, to be here this evening. I wanna thank um, Jessica and Brad and all the good folks um, at Southeast Ohio History Center for inviting me to speak. As Jessica said, I'm from Jackson County, so I'm uh, a local kid. I, I grew up in the area. So the work of the History Center is really important to me and I, I appreciate being able to participate in it even in a, in a small way. Um, I'm gonna be reading several poems tonight. Poems aren't like instruction manuals, so I won't be explaining them per se. Um, I want us to experience them and see how Southern Ohio inspires poetry and how that poetry might help us to live more fully in Southern Ohio um, I, or, or wherever you are. Um, I'll also be using a few images. Um, I think they'll help orient our thoughts a little bit, um, but it's mostly just to break up the text of the poem. So um, I'll, I'll have a few images of Southern Ohio in um, the slides. Um, I've uh, as a good English professor, I've found and given credit for the photos. Uh, most of them aren't mine. Um, I'm using images from somewhere else, um, but I would, uh, I would be in real serious trouble, right, if I'm plagiarizing and um, then I go and talk to my students about plagiarism. Um, this, this first slide um, there, you can see it more clearly is from Lake Catherine, just outside of, of Jackson, Ohio, Lake Catherine um, Natural Preserve. It's actually the one photograph that I took. And um, it's one of my favorite places to go when I'm in Jackson. If you've never been, it's a, um, it's a really wonderful place to go hiking. So, and um, for those of you in Athens, not too far, not too far away. Our subject tonight is Ohio and poetry. 
And um, again, as, as Jessica said in the, in the description of the talk, I used that quote from the novelist Wallace Stegner, who's not an Ohioan, he's um, from out West, but he says, no place is a place until it has had that human attention that, it's that at its highest reach we call poetry. Um, you know, it might be too much to ask of this discussion or this uh, presentation tonight that it reaches quite that high. It's, um, you know, kind of an aspirational thing to, uh, to say, but maybe this talk will, you know, cause us, all of us to reach higher or dig deeper as um, this speaking series is called. Um, maybe it helps us, just helps us to recognize that we're already um, reaching for that kind of attention wherever we are. And this talk gives us a way to understand that we're, we're doing that. Um, I, I've heard that maybe there, there are a couple of, of my old students um, who have connected this evening. Um, they will know, they will, will have heard me say if they were in a creative writing class in particular, um, that I often tell students that I'm deeply suspicious of uncomplicated happiness. Um, you know, suspicion probably was hardwired into me as um, a rural Southern Ohio kid, uh, but I've, I've always been uh, deeply suspicious of uncomplicated happiness. And I think poetry is too. It's one of the qualities that sort of brought me to, attracted me to poetry. Um, in the first place. Um, but, it's, but it's also true, and I, it's also something that I tell my students that I reject despair. Uh, poetry, the very act of writing or reading it does too, it rejects despair. So in between is kind of where poetry lives. And, and, and one of the, the, those, those two poles, there are many ways to talk about poetry um, I could I could talk for a really really long time and explore all kinds of um, you know different facets and we'd have to have you know 40 talks um, or more to to be able to do that. But one one way to think about it, one way that I think about it is that is that it lives between those poles, poetry, um, between sort of uncomplicated happiness and despair. And in there, there's this mix of uh, the things that poetry is concerned with, like grief and loss and death, but also joy and beauty and life. Good poetry, in, in my opinion, good art really, um, comes from our life. Right? It's, we write it or we make it because of our life experiences, and it goes back out into life, into um, the life of our community, our own lives, the lives of, of people who connect with it. Uh, the, the poet Christian Wyman says that we go to poetry in order to more fully inhabit our world and lives. And in doing so, we might be less apt to destroy either one of those. And so I, I, I hope, again, right, that as we reach for that kind of attention, um, that, that rises to the level of poetry, um, right? That, that we're doing that so that we can more fully inhabit, not escape our world, but fully inhabit our world, our lives. And um, I think it's a good goal um, to be less apt to destroy those things, right? Um, so when thinking about Ohio and of the poetry in it, I don't want to reside in either the either of those places, the simplistic happiness or nostalgia. I, I grew up in the 80s. We're very nostalgic uh, people who grew up in the 80s, right? We were always thinking about, um, you know, what happened in the 80s. Uh, but um, I don't want to I don't want to just live there in a simplistic kind of happiness, nostalgia, or in that pole of despair, even though. Um, we all know if we live in the region, if we live in Appalachia, if we live in, in Southern Ohio, that we face really, really serious problems, right? But, but both, um, but poetry can, can teach us how to live in, in between those poles. A couple of years ago, I was visiting my parents in, in Jackson, Ohio, and I, um, I went to AutoZone to get brake pads for my car. And I cannot do very many things in terms of um, fixing my car, uh, but I can change the brakes and I wanted to, you know, honor my father. 
And so I'm going to go do that, right? I'm going to go uh, change the brake pads in my car. So I get there to AutoZone and um, I gave my zip code because they needed my zip code because they always need numbers. And there's a man standing at the at the end of the counter. He didn't work at AutoZone, just standing there. And he said to me, not from around here, huh? And um, I didn't expect to sort of bristle. Um, that's not a question that I would have thought like would have just made me bristle a little bit, but I'm sort of looking down at him like, what? You know, I, I grew up here. This is, you know, the place where, uh, you know, I, I'm from. Um, but I said, I told him I grew up in Jackson, but I live somewhere else. And, and he said, good for you. This is a dead place, a fast food place. And I was kind of stunned. Um, I don't think I articulated anything. I sort of mumbled something back, got my breaks and, and, and left. But I was thinking about all of these um, things at the same time. One of them, I have to admit, was that as a writer, I was thinking, I got to remember that thing that he just said. I got to get back <laughs> and write that down as fast as possible. I think I was writing it um, in the car as soon as I got out into the car. Um, but I was also thinking about the truth of what he said and also counter arguments to, to what he said. Here's the thing. Poetry asks that of me. Um, it asks that of us to say both yes and no, to, to reach for a kind of attention that sees all of a place. Um, in many ways, that guy um, is not wrong. Um, there are so many problems in Southern Ohio and, and being aware of them is deeply important. So uh, poetry teaches me to say yes to that man, to the man who, who's apparently loafing in AutoZone like a character in a Wendell Berry novel. I say, yes, um, you have plenty of reasons to say that. But also um, as I drive down Route 23, hills start to rise just north of Chillicothe and my blood pressure um, starts to fall. Um, you start to enter what I, what I think of as geological time. Um, again, as I said in the blurb um, and, and Jessica read so well, uh, Southern Ohio is a place of compression and it's like poetry in that way or poetry is like it in that way. Um, it's an ancient ocean and glaciers layered and pressed and crumpled this place in the hills, valleys deep with shale and limestone and veins of coal. It's also a place of human life and language that deserves attention that reaches as high as possible. Um, we can use that metaphor, the, the metaphor of compression, to speak of, of what poetry is doing with language, certainly the experiences and images and ideas, emotions compressed into a really small place, and also the striation of lines and the potential surprises that we find when we're reading um, poetry, right? But that, that um, compression is also um, putting us again in the center of those poles, right? Of just everything's fine, right? Everything's happy and we're not really thinking about anything or everything's terrible and it's just full of despair, right? We get sort of compressed into that middle, um, that middle part. That's what I was um, doing when I'm only gonna read one of my own poems, but this, this is um, the poem. Um, my life is like this. And it's a poem which I'm, I'm thankful to say was published by New Ohio Review back in 2019. Um, and it was New Ohio Review is one of those uh, publications that I was so deeply, um, it was really important for me to try to get published there um, because it's so close to home and it, uh, it does a lot of good for our, for our region. Um, so here's the poem. My life is like this. Each night I keep trying to say something specific before sleep, something about time or the horizon, how time unwinds like a copperhead or the fear of a copperhead or the spaces between hay bales under porch steps. I try to say something about the ash of memory, a farmhouse firm in my mind and burned to the ground of my childhood. 
standing and consumed every moment. About the distance light travels from the glacier crumpled Southern Ohio hills to the shadowed valley bottoms. The horizon that weighs down the eye reduces the world to a hollow, a creek, a hardwood canopy, ivy overcoming ancient leaning barns, a half sunk Ford Pinto in the speckled blue of a robin's egg in the grass. I want to say something of men speaking under a great sugar maple in the late summer dark, a mud dauber tapping against a window, my mother speaking her mother's name. In my dream, the words are exactly the thing itself. Time, horizon, copperhead, dark, robin's egg in grass, my mother at last, revelation. So uh, one of the things that's really important to poetry is imagery. And um, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of imagery uh, that I've tried to pack into this poem. Um, imagery is actually, uh, in poetry, when we talk about it, we're really talking about the five senses. Um, so, you know, it's not just um, an image like uh, a visual, but also um, right, sound, uh, taste, touch, smell, right? all, of, all of those things. Mostly I have um, visual images going, going on in this poem. Here's a, um, again, hopefully you can see this um, okay, but this is, a, this is actually a Google Maps view of my grandparents' place. Um, just uh, in, in Jackson County, um, outside of Wellston, Ohio. It's one of the places I have in mind um, when, I, when I was writing this poem. The poem took me a really long time um, to write. It took me um, a number of years and probably went through about 50 uh, different um, drafts in order to get to where, where it is. Sometimes they, they just sort of fall out of the sky and they're almost ready. And sometimes they take a really long time but I think it's probably, um, you know, this poem needed that because I was trying to say something specific, uh, right? And it just took me a really long time to get there. Uh, but this is the kind of place that I, I have in mind, right? You can't see the sort of topography, but you can see um, this, this overhead um, shot, the, the really white um, building there is the, the roof of my grandparents' house. There's another little building sort of in the woods and that's their garage. And in between, there used to be a big sugar maple that's in, the, that's in the poem, but it's no longer there. Though I think if you go to the back of this property, you could um, still find that half sunk Ford Pinto. It's back, in, it's back in there. Not all of my poems are, um, you know, are this uh, sort of biographical, but the, this one, you know, most, most of the time I'm I'm pulling in stuff from all over the place. So this one's a, a much more biographical poem because I wanted to um, show Southern Ohio and I wanted to give some of the, the really significant images um, of, of my childhood. Um, this poem, like this talk, uh, is about poetry, trying to say something specific, but not quite getting there. It's also obviously about Ohio, these images, the crumpled hills, the, the valley bottoms, creeks, snakes, barns, and so on that, that fill my imagination. The, the truth is, I don't even know if I ever, I can't, I can't remember for sure if I ever saw a copperhead, but they took up an inordinate amount of space in my head throughout my life. I you know, was tramping through the, the woods and I would be thinking about, um, you know, copperheads down on ponds and all that. I would always be thinking about copperheads. I don't even know if I ever saw one, um, but it, you know, it was filled my imagination then and, and does now. Much of it feels like uh, sort of an elegy and maybe that's just because of the way I read it, but I couldn't write something like this um, without a, a great deal of love uh, for this place. And that, that has animated, um, again, my imagination of, of Southern Ohio. I'm going to mostly avoid talking about, um, you know, craft, uh, the craft of writing um, poetry. 
this evening, um, you know, craft ideas, though it's hard for me to, to do that. But one thing to notice, one, one thing when you're reading poetry to notice is the way that lines are shaped. Um, at some point, I realized that this kind of form and a lot of breaks um, in the way that I have um, started writing, uh, it, it mimics a bit the, the place that I'm from, um, you know, those striations of our land that are present there. It, again, and that, that kind of form of Ohio um, shapes a bit of the, right, the logic and the form um, that I, I'm, I'm writing in. Not always, but a lot of times. Sometimes it's, it's slag, right? It's all broken up. Um, and, and sometimes it's something much more um, beautiful than that. Speaking of beautiful, um, I'm going to uh, read a James Wright poem. Uh, it would be really hard for me to give a presentation about Ohio and poetry without James Wright. Um, Wright is one of Ohio's literary giants. Um, he's much more deeply conflicted about Ohio. He's from um, further, further east than Athens um, over in Martin's Ferry, um, you know, Zanesville, all of, all of those um, kind of areas. Um, so he's more deeply conflicted about Ohio than I am um, because I think of his just background and the way that he experienced life here, there. But he does keep saying sort of both yes and no to his love for the place. You read some James Wright poems and, and Ohio is, um, is pretty rough. Um, but you, you also see his love for, for the place. Beautiful Ohio, Ohio isn't one of his best known poems probably, but I think it serves our purposes for attention that's, that's reaching really high for the, the place where we are. Beautiful Ohio. Those old Winnebago men knew what they were singing. All summer long and all alone, I had found a way to sit on a railroad tie above the sewer main. It spilled a shining waterfall out of a pipe somebody had gouged through the slanted earth. 16,500 more or less people in Martin's Ferry, my home, my native country, quickened the river with the speed of light. And the light caught there the solid speed of their lives in the instant of that waterfall. I know what we call it most of the time, but I have, to, I have my own song for it. And sometimes, even today, I call it beauty. As I said, right sort of teeters on the edge of despair, often when, when writing about Ohio. And even when he's writing about Ohio as beautiful, um, it's a poem that comes out um, sort of like this. Most of what he experienced, um, what we read in his poetry was the grief and loss and death and subjects that um, poetry explores frequently, but Wright explores them um, frequently in uh, relationship to Ohio. He was in an area, right, that's like right on the edge of the, oh, you know, what, what came to be called the Rust Belt and, um, right, steel mills and, um, you know, coal coming through and the loss of those jobs. And even when the jobs were there, how hard um, those jobs were on the, on the people. Um, here, though, he uses um, the image of a sewage drain and then mixes it with what in another poem could be a really lovely um, light on a waterfall sort of image. And he mixes these two things together. There's, you know, the fact that we can't get away from the fact that he's sitting on a railroad tie and it's above the sewer main and what we know is coming out of there isn't like pure water. Um, all right, it's, it's sewage from uh, Martin's Ferry. Uh, but he's, he's, he's mixing these things together. You get this, you know, this image of the sewer drain, but you get the loveliness of the light on the waterfall, the brightness and the movement and the sound that a waterfall um, would give us. And um, he's, he's trying, I think, to give us the beauty of 16,500 more or less people 
in Martins Ferry, Ohio, my home, my native country. Um, again, I'm not gonna try to get too like creative writing teacher on you, um, but look at the layering of, of that. Like you get halfway down this um, poem and you see that 16,500 more or less people. Um, the, the way lines work, um, they work both together and separately. It's one, one of the really great things about lineated poems is that the line is a unit of thought all by itself. So it says something and then it gets complicated by the next line down. In this case, the first line seems to be almost a judgment. Some of these people are more people, more human, more or less people, more or less human than others. Uh, but then he drops down in Martin's Ferry, my home, my native country. Uh, when he drops down, now the speaker is implicated in this and all that's going on. Um, you know, the, the beauty and also, right, the, the earthiness and the fact that human beings, um, you know, do this kind of thing. Not only, um, right, we, we have to um, get rid of our excrement, but sometimes we do so in a way that, right, sends it out into um, a river, All right? He's implicated in both the, the, the badness, the struggle, the, the awfulness of it, but also in the beauty of it. To him, the, it isn't really the light on the waterfall, it's, it's the people. Um, the light on the waterfall is an image that holds all the sort of abstract weight of Wright's feelings about the people, the good and the bad. Um, the people, this is Martin's Ferry, by the way, which comes from uh, martinsferry.org. So you can go there, see this, uh, see this photograph. I think it's actually uh, lo longer, so sort of a panoramic uh, um, view. This is where James Wright lived. Um, all right, but he's talking about the people. The, the, it's easy, even, in, even as a Southern Ohio person or an Appalachian person, it's easy to disparage ourselves, um, to accept what the Nigerian novelist um, Chimanda Adichie called a single narrative. Um, right, she movingly in a, a TED talk and in other places um, talked about um, single narrative. And I, I think it's easy for us as Southern Ohio people to accept that, to, to accept, you know, um, uh, the, the single narrative. Like I'm assuming people do everywhere, but we bristle at the way we're depicted, flyover, hillbillies, deliverance, et cetera. All, all of those things are depictions of people from our area. But sometimes we, I think we also feel justified in making the same claims about the people around us, um, right? And, and there's a, a sense of shame that maybe, you know, um, pushes us more toward that pole of despair about the place where we live. One of my dear friends, another native son of Southern Ohio asked me why I loved Southern, I seem to love Southern Ohio so much and why I wasn't running from it. Um, and I, I know I'm lucky to have had parents that I love and extended family that despite all of our flaws and issues were admirable enough um, to allow me the space to reject the premise of that single narrative. Um, but, but they did, they, they gave me that space and you know that there was not all good um, I don't look back on it and find all of it to be good. In fact, some of it was deeply, um, you know, uh, hurtful or, you know, there, there were things about family life and all of that, right? People around us, neighbors and all of that, that was, was really, really terrible. And yet um, they gave me that space um, to sort of reject the premise of this single narrative and see all the admirable things about the place. My father was a coal miner for pretty much all of his working years. And uh, I went to a lot of union coal mining, <laughs> union picnics and spent time at softball tournaments and pick up basketball games and coal miners are rough and exactly what you would imagine in many ways. Um, 
but a coal miner also sent home a copy of The Hobbit with my dad one day. Um, he said, I, you know, I think your son would, in, would enjoy this. Um, they're, they're not one thing, right? They're, they're many and varied as their voices. Um, the, the voices that I love, I love um, the voices of poets who are from Appalachia, who are from the, the region. There's a pace to that I often get um, told that I, you know, I speak slowly, uh, and uh, my wife especially is constantly like, you know, uh, hurry it, up, hurry it up. Um, but I love those voices. I love the pace, the the accent. Though my own accent, you know, has been sharpened a, a little bit. Right, some of the the um, the rounded parts of Southern Ohio and Appalachia have gone away. Um, I I I love hearing those voice voices. Um, and I love to reject that um, single narrative. I think um, rejecting the single narrative is a, a little bit of, of what the poet Roy Bentley um, is, is getting at in his poem, The Nascent Soul Selects a Set of Appalachian Parents. So let me read Roy's poem. The, nat the nascent soul selects a set of Appalachian parents. There's this ledge you look over, a railing you lean out from and stare down at the world of souls like the feeder at sea world. And I didn't know a hillbilly from dark matter, a skewered star looking down beside a hallelujah gallery of bureaucratic angels. My soon-to-be parents would move from Kentucky to Ohio so I wouldn't go hungry as a kid and I wouldn't have to be referred to unfavorably in comparison to a coal bucket. So what if I didn't know my ass from a glass of buttermilk? So what if I'd lug a Southern accent around like a school bag? A box of rocks might have had more walking around sense, but I was sure that I'd be happy the way he looked at her and the way she looked back at him like we'd be all right, a family. And if it didn't happen this way, it could have. Who can say that it didn't? I mean, there's all this talk of heaven they've gone to now having left the body. I'm just saying it works both ways or it should. I'm saying any given heaven goes by several names. And one of those is a synonym for Fleming Neon. I really love this poem because the perspective here, Bentley's um, selecting his Appalachian parents. Again, um, you know, I know a number of my friends and a number of um, the people I, I grew up around and, you know, they wanted to get away. Um, wanted to, you know, to find a way to do a little bit of what I have done, which is, uh, you know, uh, smooth away some of the some of the accent, or I get away from all that stuff. Maybe our our family um, has sort of embarrassed us. But Bentley here is selecting Appalachian parents, right? He's got he's up in heaven, he's looking down and going, yeah, these are the people. Um, he imagines his soul choosing them as opposed to parents from somewhere else. He watches them struggle with a single narrative that might be attached to their son, uh, dumber than a coal bucket, doesn't know his ass from a glass of buttermilk, the Kentucky accent. Uh, but even though his parents made these changes for him, the poet is somehow able to love the place that nurtured his parents into the kind of people that could love, right? Here's a, here's a poet um, paying attention to a place and reaching high enough to write poetry, to grasp the poetry in it. Um, I chose this poem in part because it's, it's rejecting that narrative, but it's also, I, I chose it because uh, my own great grandmother lived in Neon, Kentucky. Um, here's Neon, Kentucky. And um, in the in the poem, the speaker starts by, you know, starts in heaven looking down, um, saying, there's a ledge you look over, a railing leaning out from and staring down at the world. Um, right? he's, he's in heaven saying that. Um, but I wonder if that's 
also what came of traveling there for Roy, because this is also an experience of traveling, at least in the early 80s, to Neon, Kentucky, to Fleming Neon. Um, narrow roads that look down into deep gorges out over mountaintops, um, right? And this is the way that when we, we went there, it was super scary. Uh, these really, really narrow roads and you're looking down over the edge. Um, you know, if, you're, if uh, your dad um, sort of, you know, goes just a little bit too far to the right, you're, you're heading over the edge. Um, all right, but Bentley doesn't shy away in this poem from the stereotype, he even seems to accept it, but then he goes beyond it to something much richer and, and more important. Again, there, there's poetry, the clear-eyed reaching toward something higher, which I, which I really love, All right? A, a person who can look at, um, you know, sort of poor, depressed, neon Kentucky, um, that can look at Jackson, Ohio, that can look at um, you know, the greater Athens um, area or look, you know, um, into Appalachia, all, all over Appalachia and see something um, that is, um, you know, not entirely good, but not, um, you know, not despair. And then to, to walk that line in between. I think one of the, the uh, poets, writers, that we as Appalachian people, and I, I think as a person from Ohio, uh, owe a lot to is, is Wendell Berry. Berry isn't an Ohioan, but um, his voice is one that I immediately recognized when I first read his poetry. And I'd recommend his writing to you, especially if you want to explore how a poet from um, our region, Appalachia, uses sound and particular words of our region. Um, this this poem's not, um, you know, sort of packed with that, but ju just listen to the sort of simplicity, the beautiful resonance um, that, uh, that, that goes on in this poem. They sit together on the porch. They sit together on the porch, the dark almost fallen, the house behind them dark, their supper done with, they have washed and dried the dishes, only two plates now, two glasses, two knives, two forks, two spoons, small work for two. She sits with her hands folded in her lap at rest. He smokes his pipe, they do not speak. And when they speak at last, it is to say what each one knows the other knows. They have one mind between them now that finally for all it's knowing will not exactly know which one goes first through the dark doorway bidding good night and which one which sits on a while alone. No poet that we've encountered here tonight has used overwrought dialect. Um, you can you can see here in this Wendell Berry poem. I mean, you get you know um, porches in uh, in rural southern Ohio. You get um, supper um, right rather than than dinner. Um, but he's not using a bunch of dialect, right? Um, he's not trying to force southern Ohio or Appalachia on you. But the subtle pace and tone of poems really all the poems that we've seen here this evening, um, right? They're, they're kind of a sample, a small sample of the kind of richness of language of our place. And I think it's, it's good to be reminded sometimes that, that we do have a richness in, in our language and the words we use. Um, I, always, I always think um, of the fact that my grandmother used the word mango for a um, bell pepper. <laughs> Um, like a green bell pepper uh, for when I was growing up. I thought that's what it was called, a, a mango, because that's what my, my grandmother called it, which I, I would imagine came um, from back in uh, her, you know, her Kentucky roots. She was not a woman to call things what they weren't supposed to be called. So it was really um, uh, surprising to me when I eventually learned that the thing was not <laughs> really called a mango. Um, uh, right. But uh, it's not something to be embarrassed of or wished away, the, the, the kind of um, language that, that we use. 
Um, okay, so one last poem, and then I'm gonna be then I'm gonna be done. Um, this is the the last one. It's not an Appalachian poet. It's um, a Jewish poet, Yehuda Amakai. When I when I read this poem, um, it takes me back to sort of tramping through the woods alone or with friends, coming across the foundation of an old house. There's a lot of resonance. It does you know it doesn't have to be Southern Ohio um, poet to have resonance with our place. Um, um, this poem does more. It, it challenges us to do that, to reach high, to give real attention to our inner life um, in the place of our bodies and minds and emotions. And I'm just going to leave you um, with this, right? It rejects uncomplicated happiness, but also despair. So this is, this is the last poem for tonight. Um, the Place Where We Are Right by Yehuda Amakai. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and love dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Um, this is not, I have nothing else to say about this slide other than I just desperately wanted to put this slide. It's close to Leo Petroglyph in, in rural Southern Ohio. Uh, you might not be able to see down there at the bottom it says the end time house of prayer, which is another poem I'm trying um, pretty desperately to write. I hope to be able to do that um, sometime in the future. This is this image, I don't know. Um, look up Leo Petroglyph, you'll see this uh, image. And, Carol uh, took a nice photograph. Um, got a few poems coming out in Appalachian Review and local local culture, uh, but I'll um, I'll back out of this now. And I think maybe we have some some questions. John, that was beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Um. I haven't seen Brad sending me any questions. Has he put any in the chat for you? Yes, there's a there's a um, a couple of poems or a couple I'm sorry poems. Um, a couple of questions here. When writing a poem, oh. do you sit down and plan on writing, or is it um, spontaneous? Um, it's absolutely planned. If I'm spontaneous, it almost never happens. Uh, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> The, the poet, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, as disciplined as the poet William Stafford, but I, I sort of take him as one of my um, uh, mentors. I mean, he was up every morning, he set a time for himself and, and, and would write. Um, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm out and about and somebody says something to me like, this is a dead place, a fast food place, and then I have to go back and write it like as fast as I can, um, but yeah inspiration, it doesn't really strike me. Um, I have to sit down and really work at it. Um, when and how did you get started writing poetry? Um, that's a, a really good question, probably far longer answer than I uh, um, can give here, but I, I really didn't start writing poetry until my um, early 30s. I, I had I'd written little things, I don't know what you would call them whenever I was younger. And I, I sort of moved um, away from that. Um, I was always a reader, um, but um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know why I focused my attention probably more on, you know, football and all of that kind of thing whenever I was, uh, you know, in my teenage years. And I just didn't, I just didn't, um, really get into writing poetry until I got on this little green, I don't, it's probably back there, um, but there's a, a green volume of Wendell Berry's um, collected poems. And I heard a voice um, that I understood. And um, I, also, I also read something that I realized, uh, you know, I'm not overtly emotional um, all the time. Um, and so, you know, I had thought maybe poetry was supposed to be that and I just didn't see a place for myself. And then I, I realized the kind of depth of emotion that um, Wendell Berry had. It wasn't on the surface, it was kind of down deep and that, that helped me. So I was, I was probably in my 
in my 30s. Um, which, by the way, when I started writing, then all of my poems looked like <laughs> Wendell Berry poems. So if you start writing, you know, your your influences will do that. That's great. You should allow them to do that. And later on, you know, you kind of break, break away um, from that. And then the third thing that I have here um, is what do you think makes Ohio Southeastern Ohio poetic? Well, hopefully a lot of what I said in the, um, in the talk will, will help answer that. Um, it, it's, it's all of the things, right? It's the, it's the, it's the images, right? The, the hardwood um, forests, the, the, that geologic kind of um, structures that you see, those things um, are, um, yeah, deeply impactful for me and are a part of my imagination. Um, uh, but as I also said, right, there's, there's so much sound, the bird song and, and um, creeks and rivers, um, but also people's voices. And, you know, I, I, I maybe lost something in myself whenever I, um, when I moved away um, in terms of you know, the, the kind of accent that I, that I probably had, I know I had, because when I went to Ohio State, my friends there were like, are you from Georgia? Uh, <laughs> I'm like, mm, no, I'm from just like, you know, 80 miles south of here. Um, i like, that's, I don't know, it's not, a, I don't think it's a genteel Southern accent that I have. Um, it's something else. Um, all right, I don't want to be disparaging to my, my own um, accent. But, um, right, I think, those sounds are beautiful. I think they're beautiful. They're important. And, um, you know, again, we, you know, fighting against that narrative of this is like hillbilly, whatever. Um, you know, it, you really need to, you know, we really need to think about the fact that people like the Beatles um, were influenced by uh, real country music. You know, they wanted to hear, that's what they wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear the other stuff that was, was popular at the time. Um, so if, if it's cool enough for the Beatles, right, it's got to be cool enough for for us. Um, but there, there's there's a lot. I mean, I, I, I could go on and on, but I, I, I won't do that. Um, um, but certainly also, by the way, just um, the suffering, right? I mean, we have um, uh, the loss of, of jobs, the loss of, um, you know, when when the United States said go big or get out of farming, right? It just crushed so many farmers. Um, so a way of life was was gone. We're like, oh, we're gonna be, you know, there's many things about being progressive that I I would like. There are also other things where, you know, right, you wanna call that into question. And some of that has has really hurt um, the area, right? Coal came in, um, it, it paid for my life and my education and I appreciate it and it, yet it's also, Right, damaging in many ways, and when you when coal goes away, um, you know that it it hurts um, the the region and opioids, and we got all you know all of this, and all of that's also poetic, right? It's a part of the poetic um, um, sort of uh, experience, and it, if it doesn't lead us all the way to despair, um, right, it can be something that enters in and, and enriches us. I think that's, are those are the ones that I, that I have here. Any? I think that's all I'm seeing too. I don't see any in our Facebook group. So um, yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was, uh, it was a real joy and pleasure to, to be with you this evening. Yeah. Um, and return forward, a little bit to your roots. To, yes, absolutely. I'll look forward to, uh, um, jumping on and seeing uh, other people, uh, you know, for the deeper roots or deeper, uh, what was it? Deeper, digging deeper. Yes. Dig deeper. That's yeah. And that's a perfect segue because our next one is Thursday, June 17th, and we will be hosting um, one of our new board members, David Butcher, who will be talking about African-American settlements in Southeast Ohio, specifically in Athens County, there was a multi-racial, multi-ethnic settlement called Tablertown. And um, he'll be talking a little bit about its history and the work he's doing to preserve that. And I think it's gonna be a great talk. So 5.30 on the 17th, I hope you come too. 
Yeah, I, I will be there. So hopefully everybody else will. Everybody else is too. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. All right. Have a great evening, everyone. And we will see you on June 17th.